say hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you from wherever you are dialing in from. My name is Oriel Fernandez, and I lead our CHAI Hepatitis Program. I'd like to welcome all of you and, and really thank you for taking the time out of your day today to participate in this webinar that's launching uh, CHAI's third edition of our Hepatitis C Market Report, which this time includes some insights into the market for harm reduction. Uh, I want to say up front, as with everything that CHAI does, we produced this report thanks to the many contributions of many stakeholders who engaged with us. First and foremost, ministries of health in the countries we support, suppliers and distributors, civil society, and WHO, and many other partners we work with. Um, finally, I want to especially thank my team across our hepatitis program who supported the development of this report, especially members of our hepatitis markets and diagnostics team, Navya Sharma, Rithavan Gautam, and Rovia Islam, who coordinated and really led this process from end to end, and you'll hear from them later in this webinar. So just to dive in, could I have the next slide, please? Great. So just to share some you know, quick top line messages. While hepatitis C care has no doubt gained momentum over the last few years, it remains a major health challenge with uh, still very few people being diagnosed and treated beyond uh, a few countries who have really championed programs over the last few years. And, you know, honestly, I think this is quite tragic because as I'm sure you'll hear through the course of this webinar, we have really highly effective tools simplified guidelines and policies now that enable us to decentralize these tools. And we now also have very significant market opportunities that have enabled um, some of the lowest pricing that we've seen over the last 10 years for drugs and diagnostics. So I think it's just incredibly important that the global community, specifically donors and ministries of health, identify the financing to ensure that these advances uh, in the market over the last few years really do translate into more patients being tested and treated. Could I have the next slide? Okay, so CHI's market intelligence reports aim at supporting a range of stakeholders to understand the market dynamics and leverage market intel to advocate and secure better pricing for key diagnostics and drugs. Through these reports, we, we aim to do several things. You know, firstly, build market transparency to ensure that countries, primarily LMICs, have visibility into high quality products at affordable prices. Secondly, the reports aim to showcase key drivers and barriers to scale diagnostics and treatment commodities as countries expand viral hepatitis programming. And lastly, the reports aim to provide an outlook for emerging market trends and innovations that really do have the potential to drastically improve care for patients. And as you can see on the left hand side uh, of the slide, Chai has now published three editions of the hepatitis C e market report thus far, along with a shorter brief on the hepatitis B market report, which we hope to expand on over the next two years. Can I have the next slide, please? So for, for this specific third edition uh, of the report, we're covering several topics. Um, topics range from strategies to achieve sustainable and affordable access to hepatitis C diagnostics and treatment, an overview of the supply landscape for hepatitis C diagnostics and treatment, pricing trends for liver function tests, rapid diagnostic tests, viral load and DAAs, procurement volume trends, uh, along with emerging diagnostic innovations. And for the first time ever, we'll also be covering some preliminary insights into the market for harm reduction commodities. Can I have the next slide, please? So this slide just captures the, the agenda we're gonna try to get through today. And as you can see, we have quite a full uh, agenda for this webinar that covers reflections on the hepatitis C landscape uh, a deep dive into highlights from our market report and a range of perspectives on the importance and impact of market intelligence. And finally, I hope we'll have some time at the end for questions and discussions. So please do put your questions in the Q&A function and we'll aim to address them during the discussion. So I think moving us onwards to our first speaker, um, I wanna hand it over to Dr. Meg Doherty, um, who'll be sharing some reflections on the hepatitis C landscape and how it's evolved over the last few years. Um, I'm sure Meg doesn't require any introductions in this forum. She's the director of the Department of Global 
HIV, hepatitis, and sexually transmitted infection programs at the WHO and leads an incredible team who have led a lot of the policy and programmatic advancements that we've seen in the hepatitis C landscape over the last few years. So Meg, I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to come in. I hope you're hearing me well. Um, and uh, of course, yes, uh, many of the items we'll be bringing up and discussing here are not brand new, but on the other hand, we have, I think your report the, that's coming out of Chai is really highlighting how we really do need to take the mission very seriously right now and identify the areas and the gaps that are not moving forward because there is no reason that we shouldn't be able to move forward with better access and better impact. So if we can go, to, I also put in a bit more on not just hep C, but hep B, because we consider these together in many ways at WHO. Our last report, and we're in the middle of updating this right now, gave you the indication of how big of a problem this is. Um, 296 million people living with chronic hepatitis B, 58 million living with chronic hepatitis C. And to be honest, when we look forward, if we don't do something now, this will outstrip TB, HIV, and all of our other major communicable diseases in terms of impact and uh, deaths um, here by 2040. So we are taking this seriously and we are also worried that we're in a bit of a lull in terms of, imp of um, implementation. Next slide, please. So for us globally on this report, we looked at how we were going to try to make our 20 30 or SDG target goals, which is around elimination. And I think what we'll see when we do launch our, our report later in this year for the World Health Assembly, that we're in a bit of a pause phase or a stalling area and we need much to do much more. And already we had huge expectations that we'd be able to put many more people on treatment, many more people diagnosed and, um, and uh, let's see what we can do together. Next slide, please. And this you've seen before, but it it's uh, shown a little bit differently on the left hand side in orange is hepatitis C, right hand side is hepatitis B, and the undiagnosed is the very light colored and diagnosed and then on treatment are a little bit darker colors. And what you can see for hep B, uh, we're way off mark in terms of being able to diagnose and treat, but for hep C, where it seems we have the tools access and pricing are available. We're still having gaps and certainly by region we're having gaps. And I think we should be taking this forward region and country by country as we try to solve some of those gaps. Next slide, please. <coughs> so we have our global health sector strategies. They were endorsed in 2022 and already in 2024 this year, we're going back to the World Health Assembly to report out on our accountability. Have we achieved those strategic directions we were hoping to? And is this moving us towards those elimination targets? And essentially, um, those five strategic directions, I think you're well aware of, but how each country and then utilizing the access to the various tools, um, are they synergistically helping us um, achieve our goals is something we're all uh, interested in digesting a bit more. So next slide, please. So within our strategies, and I think this, we have targets, we have impact targets on the burden of infection, prevalence, mortality, something you've seen before. And we moved in 2022 now to absolute targets of elimination. And I think those kinds of targets require that we have access to tools and diagnostics. But we also have milestones. And some of those milestones, this report from HEPs, from CHAI is important for because it talks about drug and diagnostic access. And if we're not making those milestones right now, what are we going to do to change that trajectory? So just a reminder of what we have there. Next slide, please. And so we look at this as a results chain, and I think we have to look at our impact, our outcomes, but then go back into the inputs right up front on the left hand side and say, where are some of the areas that we could improve? Political awareness, commitment in action, I think is happening in some countries, but not maybe in all. Adequate funding, and I know in this market access report we talk about, are there gaps in funding or are there ways to overcome that 
for, for example, through public private partners approaches. Are the commodities and the technologies at the place where they need to be used? And lastly, are we using the data? And we don't have as much of a structured data system as we have for other diseases. But if we do have the data, are we using the data to improve and move towards that impact of ending the epidemic of hepatitis? Next slide, please. So we have some high level shifts we'd like to see, and some of those are you know, mirrored in the report. Um, certainly around harm reduction, it's so good to be able to see that there's some um, outlining of the of the commodities around harm reduction mm -hmm. in this report. Mm -hmm. Okay, and also um, I think also making things simpler and and looking at opportunities where we can uh, say, for example, with triple elimination or with um, path to elimination for hepatitis C, that we can actually generate a bit of political momentum. Next slide, please. Just to say across each of these strategic directions, the vision is there and the tools are there, just like we heard from Oriol. Um, but I think we're also updating the tools and in making, and making, for example, this year on people-centered um, uh, guidance and guidelines, we'll have updated hepatitis B guidelines and Delta guidelines. How do we improve those for not only moving the hepatitis B and and Delta, but could it move hepatitis C in certain countries? Next slide. Um, how do we ensure that in countries they're using those tools for impact? They have it in their national strategic plans. Are they being updated? And are they developing their own targets within their country programs? Next slide, please. And then we are been working for years, and hopefully this year we'll be coming out with a uh, set of tools on how to do person-centered and uh, data and monitoring so that countries can actually start to set up their own tools, whether it's EMR, et cetera, to be able to monitor their data. And with a report that will come out in April for us with new EPI estimates, I think we have to use that as a new baseline to ensure every year, every two years, we're getting countries to report and move stepwise towards their targets. Next slide, please. <coughs> as well as looking at how communities can continue to push the envelope and focus on access, especially for those who are left behind, such as key populations. Next slide. And lastly, on our last strategic direction, whatever innovations are available. I know we've been talking a lot about potential innovations for hepatitis B and C, but for hepatitis C, those innovations are there. And are they being utilized and maximized? And are the access prices being, being actualized in every country? And that's where I think we need as a global community to reinforce with ministries that a little bit of investment in will give them a large return. And so as we look for the next innovation, whether it's a hep C vaccine or a single shot DAA, we obviously need to use what's available to us right now. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I want to just focus a little bit of on what we need to accelerate access. And um, I think we've heard about this before, but focusing on a public health per approach and increasing that awareness and using any approaches with in terms of commitment and leadership. So we need some more champion countries coming on board. Next slide, please. And thinking about the path to elimination, and if you could just click, I think we brought this up this year because we thought it would be a very important way to motivate some countries. And we know that we, you have heard that Egypt achieved gold tier on the path to elimination for hepatitis C, but they haven't reached it all the targets yet or the mortality targets. So encouraging and continuing to put that on the agenda for other countries, I think will allow us to maximize the use of the, the tools that are available. If you can just next slide, please. These are the targets, you've seen them before. Next slide, please. And this is the celebration of Egypt, huge, huge, um, uh, great achievement, but it's one country. And if they stop, 
if they don't continue on with reducing deaths and mortality, I think we would like them to eventually see that we have achieved the full elimination of hepatitis C and encourage them to bring on hepatitis B, which they're doing right now, and thinking about what is a triple elimination approach for them. So it does encourage one country, and let's see how it can encourage others as we move forward. Next slide, please. So the last comments I'd like to make is really to congratulate Chai on this important report and just talk about how we see this fitting into achieving our 2030 goals. So we're very happy to see this third edition and we're very happy to see this market reduction around harm reduction commodities. And I think that um, more than ever, we know that the DAAs are, uh, are affordable, but why are we not using them? So a concern of note is how do we increase that demand and increase the, um, the access to the best prices possible at every country? Next slide. So what we're doing um, this year is a support and complementary to the CHI report is that we're finalizing our global report on hepatitis. So we're working on both the hepatitis B and C access, but also the global epidemiology and service coverage estimates. It will be a very important sister brother document to this hep C intelligence report. And we will also be focusing on some of the country level adoptions, where are the policies not being taken up? What are the product regulation challenges? Are there out of pocket expenditures that we need to address? And how do we think about the bigger picture of primary health care? So overall, I think we have a big, a big role uh, or a big area of work that we need to work together on for this to be able to achieve our targets. Next slide, please. <coughs> and so we will be focusing on um, hepatitis products in diagnostics, treatment and vaccination. We'll be looking at also hepatitis B in our uh, report and then we'll be going by sectors and trying to identify what each sector could be do, doing to improve their access. Next slide, please. And we want to thank, just like Oriel said, on this report for them, uh, for Chai, we've been utilizing many similar partners and we will be excited to be able to share this at the World Hepatitis um, Summit that will be coming up in April. Next slide, please. Next slide. And really looking at not only taking in the access prices, but equitable access and thinking about procurement as we move forward. So I, I do think that this analysis is very, it's, we're, we're, we're very excited to be able to share this very soon and to see how both reports um, can help countries move forward. Next slide, please. And I think that's where we want to talk about availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality. All of those elements will be part of the right to health approach that will be highlighted in the, the dimensions of the WHO report that will be coming up. Next slide, please. And um, to ensure that we have a focus on the countries, just to say, we have focused on our report coming up in 38 countries that will be coming across six regions, but we know that the greatest burden on where we're going to make our biggest difference will be in 10 countries, which comprise about 67% of the global burden. So as you take in this market intelligence report, and if you sit in those 10 countries, let us be thinking together how we can collaborate to use this intelligence use the best pricing for diagnostics and treatments and actually start to be making a real change over the next two years, three years. Because if we don't change the trajectory we're on, we may end up being behind the, the eight ball and we may not make our 2030 targets. So I think I have one last slide and then I can say thank you and pass back to Oriel. And I'll just pass back to Oriel and say thank you very much for all the support. And we're looking, next slide please, and we're looking forward to learning more about what's in your report and just to be very supportive that um, we believe um, together we should be able to achieve these targets. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Meg, for, for joining us and, and sharing very honest reflection that while we've had incredible momentum over the last few years, and while you know we, we have a vision and tools that are there and continuing to be strengthened, uh, we're in a worrying place right now and really appreciate the roadmap that WHO is developing and laying out to tell us what it'll take to really accelerate access. Um, and I think I speak for, for many people on this webinar that we're really looking forward to the global report from WHO and leveraging it to continue to work together to drive momentum. Um, thanks again. And, you know, let's now move forward um, into the core content of our market report. And I want to now hand over to Robia Islam and Nabia Sharma from Chai's Global Diagnostics and Markets team to, to take us through the key highlights. Uh, of the report. So, Robia, over to you. Thanks so much, Oriel. Hi, everyone. Um, so glad everyone could be joining today. My name is Robia Islam. I'm currently a senior associate with Chai working across our global diagnostics team and our hepatitis team, and really looking forward to walking you through some of our diagnostic highlights today. Next slide, please. Uh, before diving in, I wanted to briefly begin by highlighting some of the key diagnostic products the report focuses on within the WHO testing and treatment algorithm. The first step involves screening individuals using an HCV antibody test. This can be done in the form of rapid diagnostic tests or lab-based immunoassays. Following that, if an individual tests positive, they should be linked to confirmatory diagnostic testing to determine if they have chronic infection, which can be done through HCV RNA testing or HCV core antigen. And prior to treatment, additional liver function tests are also needed to determine the extent of liver damage, which can typically be done through non-invasive methods, which rely on standard blood chemistry tests or using other ultrasound technology. Lastly, and importantly, I wanted to highlight a major change since our last in-depth market report. In the last few years, we've seen an evolution of WHO guidance on HCV testing. These updates include new technologies and approaches that provide an opportunity to simplify testing, particularly in low resource settings and for key populations. Among these are HCV self-testing, reflex testing, and point of care HCV viral load testing, which I will be discussing shortly. Next slide, please. Um, so just beginning with the supply side landscape of HCV antibody screening tests, since our last update, all the RDTs and lab-based immunoassays have retained WHO pre-qualification status. In addition to this, two HCV RDTs have recently received WHO PQ status, signaling an expandive, expanding and competitive market. Beyond the list of WHO pre-qualification, qualified options that are listed here. There are several other options that have been approved by stringent regulatory authorities and available for procurement through major donors such as the Global Fund. I wanted to emphasize again the global gap, which was highlighted earlier, that among the chronic HCV cases globally, only 21% were aware of their diagnosis. The increasing availability of quality assured screening products can promote access and enable countries and procurement agencies to procure products that meet minimum safety and quality standards. Next slide, please. Um, so just moving us on to some of the procurement volume trends we see across HCV antibody screening tests. While there is a limited visibility into what procurement vol volumes look like from the non-donor funded space, select data available from donors such as the Global Fund indicate that countries procure significantly more RDTs than lab-based immunoassays with procurement up to 24 times higher overall. Here in this graph, you'll see that across regions, procurement of RDTs comprises 70 to 100% of overall procurement for HCV screening tests. This increased uptake in RDTs can be related to several cost and programmatic considerations, which are detailed in the report, of which we have observed some that include sample type, access to testing, time to result, and other logistical requirements. As con countries consider scaling HCV testing or aim for a universal screening approach, RDTs can offer an opportunity to decentralize testing to the lowest levels of the health system, enabling same-day tests and treat models of care. Next slide, please. Um, so also just looking at some of the price trends that we've seen across our countries, procurement of these key HCV diagnostics, including RDTs, can be procured through donors and other procurement agents such as Global Fund, PAHO, and UNDP. 
Some of the cited reference prices that we have can vary from 80 cents to around $1.10 experts pricing per HCV RDT. So here we've just looked at a sample of high burden countries um, and the final price paid for by public programs for HCV RDTs. And we can see that prices really range um, across these countries from as low as 21 cents in India to around $2.40 in Kyrgyzstan. These variations can be attributed to several factors, including differences in procurement mechanisms used by the government and some countries that also use their own locally produced products. Of the countries that we have observed last year and also looking at trends for the prices we've seen in 2023, prices have generally remained consistent as demonstrated in several countries such as India, Pakistan, Rwanda, Cambodia, Nigeria, Myanmar, and Indonesia, and in most cases have remained within the reference price range that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. So moving us on to some of the key trends that we see within the HCV viral load market. Since our last update, all suppliers and products have retained WHO PQ status across three main molecular suppliers listed here. In addition, an HCV viral load test intended for use on near point of care platforms has been added to this list. As mentioned earlier, there is a growing momentum around point of care viral load testing, particularly in light of recent WHO guideline updates, which recommend the use of point of care HCV viral load for confirmatory testing and test of cure after treatment completion. Depending on country context, near point of care platforms may offer several programmatic benefits such as improving access by decentralizing testing to facilities close to the point of patient care. I encourage you all to check out the report for more insights on these um, and other considerations for countries to think about um, weighing between near point of care and centralized lab based platforms. I also wanted to point and flag that global access program price agreements, otherwise known as gap price agreements, continue to be offered by major molecular suppliers. These enable countries and procurers to buy tests at reduced ceiling prices for essential diagnostics, including HCV viral load. Prices for viral load tests can range from around $7.90 to $14.90 with varying terms and conditions. Beyond this list of pre-qualified tests that are listed here, there are other options that have been approved by SRAs and approved for procurement through donors such as Global Fund. Next slide, please. Um, while there is limited visibility into the overall procurement volumes on a country by country basis for HCV viral load test, we were able to um, collect data across major molecular suppliers of HCV viral load to demonstrate some of the volume trends that we've seen from 2018 to 2022. And as you can see here, volumes are significantly behind um, the, the global need. As you can see here, sales peaked in 2019 at around 3.8 million tests sold. After 2019, sale volumes dropped, which is likely due to, one, deprioritized investments in hepatitis programming as a result of COVID, and high burden countries such as Egypt, um, elimination, high burden elimination countries who are approaching targets. As you can see, the majority of sales that um, were observed were in the Europe, Middle East, and Africa regions, accounting for about 55% of sales. From 2020 to 2022, we've seen a steady increase, in particular within Asia, with increasing investments from government. And as global donors look to ex expand funding allocations towards HCV programming and commodity procurements, we may continue to see increase in sales over the next few years. Next slide, please. Um, so also just looking at some of the in-country pricing trends of HCV viral load tests, um, just wanted to highlight here some of the a sample of the high burden countries which we looked at. As I did mention earlier, major molecular suppliers do offer global access pricing. These agreements are negotiated on a country by country basis and depend on many conditions, including instrument placements, test volumes. Um, in this sample of burden, high burden countries, which we looked at, we can see that prices do significantly vary um, from as low as around $6 in India to around $58 in Vietnam. And oftentimes we continue to see countries still pay, paying a high final price per HCV viral load test. And this can be attributed to um, many different factors, including the added cost components that, um, that are seen once 
products move from the seller, including customs, distributor fees, logistics, and clearing. Um, next slide, please. Finally, as countries expand hepatitis programming, there are new and innovative diagnostic tools which can simplify testing, save time, and generate cost savings, making testing more affordable and accessible. A few diagnostic um, technologies that I wanted to note, HCV self-tests have a growing body of evidence suggesting that they are usable, acceptable, and preferred, particularly among key populations. There are several products in the pipeline, which I've um, put in this table here, and you can see um, all of these are research use only with plans later to enter the market, which depend on factors such as regulatory approvals, pricing, and ongoing research and clinical trials. HCV core antigen is an alternative to HCV viral load testing. There is evidence that suggests performance can be comparable to traditional based approaches. However, there is more evidence on uh, needed on the use and operational characteristics in LMIC context. And here just um, highlighted some of the, the ones, um, non-exhaustive list of core antigen products, um, which are also cited in our market report. DBS or dried blood spot specimens are another way to simplify sample collection. There are HCV viral load pre-qualified products that include the use of whole blood spot on DBS cards. Another key opportunity that I wanted to flag is around the use of multiplex or combination RDTs. These tests can streamline and integrate screening across multiple diseases in one, in one test. Um, the report goes into detail on some of the evidence, the growing evidence around um, combination tests and their acceptability among users, including preliminary research from Thailand, which looked at a three-in-one HCV, HBV, HIV self-test. Um, as I conclude, I just want to recap that we've seen a growing number of both quality assured and affordable test products enter the space and an increasing number of diagnostic innovations that can really simplify testing services, specifically within the context of resource limited settings. As countries expand HEP programming, these tools can promote and facilitate access to affordable testing. Thank you, everyone. And with that, I will pass on to my colleague, Navya, to walk you through the next portion. Great. Thanks so much, Rubia. Hi, everyone. I am Navya Sharma. Um, I actually used to work as a senior analyst with uh, the global markets team at Chai, of course, working across treatment and harm reduction commodities. I recently moved to the India Country Program, but I'm continuing to work on uh, hepatitis and also have picked up some supply chain work. Now, without any delays, let me kick off the next two sections of this presentation. I will be speaking to you about treatment and harm reduction markets, starting with highlights on the HCV treatment commodities. Now, let me begin with an overview of the supplier landscape. At present, um, at least one generic supplier has received a WHOPQ across key pan-genotypic DA regimens. However, we have observed some supplier exits in the past year, which we've also captured in the table that you can see on this slide. Now, while at present, the supply of quality assured generics remains fairly robust, the, this decision to not maintain a WHOPQ for certain DAs does signal a dwindling supply confidence in future demand outlook for this particular market. Now, this is something I'd like you to keep at the back of your mind as I take you through the next section on volume trends, uh, because there's quite a bit of correlation there. We can move to the next slide. Now, moving on to DA volume trends. Now, in this section, we essentially have presented an, an analysis and commentary on volumes procured across LMICs, um, DA volumes procured across LMICs. And the major database that we utilize for this particular analysis is the India Export Database, which essentially captures all the exports that are made by Indian generics um, across the world. And of course, we look at the LMIC subset of that database. Now, annual, uh, annual DA exports from Indian generics to LMICs increased by quite a bit in 2021 and 2022. Um, that was around 183% of an increase. However, this increase was primarily driven by uh, Pakistan, which had procured nearly 50,000 soft packs. Notably, Pakistan's soft orders alone accounted for approximately 67% of total exports in 2022. And we've also called that out uh, in the bars that showcase soft uh, procurement. Now, this brings me to, to the second highlight that when we exclude exports to Pakistan, the overall DA export volumes in 2022 were approximately half of the pre-pandemic level average export volumes, that is essentially the volumes between 2016 and 2020. So we necessarily, our, our export volumes have not necessarily recovered 
uh, since uh, the pandemic. And these stagnating volumes threaten supply security as, as existing supplies may exit the market. We've already seen a few exits. And uh, new suppliers are actually discouraged to enter a market that has low unpredictable volumes. We can move to the next slide. We also performed a very interesting analysis, a two-pronged analysis on the export data to understand regimen preferences across LMICs. First, we looked at procurement of Softwell, Soft, and SoftTAC FDC and calculated it as a percentage of the total yearly procurement. Now, here, um, I'd like to kind of caveat this analysis by telling you an assumption we took. That is, we essentially took soft volumes as a proxy for soft and DAC regimen volumes. And the reason being that if you procure 100 packs of SOC, soft, you will also procure 100 packs of DAC, and it's kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. So we didn't want to duplicate those volumes in our analysis. Now, we found by this analysis that in recent years, some countries opted to actually import soft well instead of individual um, singles of soft and DAC from Indian genetics, as the data shows on, your, uh, on, on the slide. We also looked at specific countries and observed that some LMICs showcase a change in their product mix. That is the graph to your right. And uh, they have recently actually uh, opted to procure soft well instead of soft DAC. Now, such countries include Ukraine, Myanmar, and Vietnam. However, I must emphasize that except for a few countries which have kind of shown this preference for procuring soft well, soft and DAC remains the preferred regimen for HCV treatment across the LMICs. We can move to the next slide. Now, the last sort of analysis that we performed um, for volume trends was that we observed uh, uh, that we kind of looked at uh, where the volumes and where exports are actually happening to, what countries are responsible for procuring. And we found a fairly recurring trend of buyer concentration where essentially a few countries account for most of the most of the DA procurement over the years. So for instance, this year, we had a concentration with Pakistan where they accounted for over 67% of yearly procurement. Now, the graph on the slide indicates the concentration of demand for soft well exported by Indian genetics in three countries in 2022. Similarly, for soft singles exports, as I've mentioned before, Pakistan, of course, accounted for over 90% of just the soft uh, singles that were exported in, the, uh, in, in 2022. Now, thanks to our colleagues at MPP, we were also able to access data for DAX sales that is reported by licensed genetics to MPP. And that also showed that in 2022, around four countries were responsible for over 85% of DAX 60MG procurement. Now, such concentration makes it very difficult for suppliers and other stakeholders to plan for demand efficiently and leads to well, longer lead times and a lot of shortages, and it really hampers sort of the supply chain um, of these commodities. We can move to the next slide. Now, we have talked about global access pricing. I know uh, our colleagues, our earlier speakers also touched upon them, and we have been uh, speaking about this, these particular ceiling price agreements across uh, different forums. I still want to kind of recap it for colleagues that may are uh, that may be new to these agreements. Now, Try and the Hepatitis Fund, along with two generic DA suppliers, signed ceiling price agreements that make DAs more affordable than ever. Public programs are now able to access a 12-week course of HCV treatment drugs, so Fosbuvir and Declatisvir, at $60 x works price. Now, there are similar agreements for diagnostics that Rubia touched upon uh, during her slides. And together, the cost of HCV commodities via these agreements, these access pricing agreements, comes to around $80 USD. I would like to urge participants to visit our website for more information on these agreements. And you are more than welcome to write to us. We'll be happy to kind of assist you in figuring out how you can also access these agreements for your uh, countries and kind of buy commodities through them. You can move to the next slide. Now, coming to the pricing trends of DAs. Now, prices of DAs have definitely significantly fallen over the years due to, of course, expansion of the competitive landscape of genetic DAs and the well, relatively increasing demand since the DAs kind of came into the market. However, there still remains significant variability in prices, as you can see in the two graphs on the screen, um, for both soft and soft tech. And this variability essentially is driven by well fragmented demand, which I've spoken about quite a bit in the volume section. It's driven by also suboptimal procurement practices. Uh, so, for instance, uh, a lot of countries may not do pooled procurement, and that typically really impacts the price in a positive manner. And lastly, in certain regions, we've also seen geopolitical instability impacting prices and, you know, kind of inducing that pricing variability. Now, the report also includes commentary on pricing accessed by the Latin American countries. 
and the barriers that they encounter due to a lack of generic competition, which of course can be attributed to licensing and patent barriers. For instance, Brazil um, procures a treatment of Softwell for about $1,400. That is a result of a national competitive tender with significant volume commitment. So they were able to negotiate the price. Um, while other countries that do not have generic access procure the same commodity for approximately $4,000. Now these countries do not have access to, they only have access to limited DA regimens and they, it really reduces their cost, uh, their choice of products and uh, pricing. And of course the ability to negotiate to the ability to negotiate prices further. We move to the next slide. Now, before concluding the treatment section, I'd also like to share a quick update on the pediatric market. Now, WHO's guidelines on HCV treatment of um, adolescents presents a significant opportunity for immediate and rapid scale up of HCV services for this particular cohort. To fully capitalize on the advantages brought on uh, brought by these by this particular guideline change countries need to undertake several key actions in a very proactive manner. These include uh, updating hepatitis guidelines to align with the latest WHO updates, implementing screening programs specifically designed for younger populations, integrating HCV care into existing pediatric services, and establishing robust referral networks to clinicians um, comfortable in treating HCV in adolescents. You can move to the next slide. Now to conclude the highlights for the treatment and diagnostic commodities, I'd like to kind of leave you with some food for thought and um, also kind of take you back to what our first two speakers said. There is still a very large burden of chronic HCV patients that remain remains to be addressed across LMICs. We definitely have made a lot of progress over the years, but there is still so much more that needs to be done. An increasing commodity availability coupled with declining prices truly offers an opportunity to address this burden. And, you know, as Meg uh, mentioned, DAs are more affordable than ever. So why do we not use them and why do we not see those sort of higher scaling up of programs and higher volumes. Now, if countries are able to access low pricing, and of course we have ceiling agreements to uh, ceiling agreements in place for that now, it truly bolsters the ability of public programs to, well, number one, optimize budgets, and number two, uh, increase coverage through scale up of services. Now, the global hepatitis community must increase its commitment to scaling up HCV programming in LMICs mobilizing resources and improving in-country service delivery. We have delene delineated six strategies that we feel will be pivotal to improving market health for hepatitis commodities and increasing um, access to services further. And of course, these include um, commitment to HCV management and public health care services, improving procurement practices, optimizing existing resources through integration, ensuring patient savings and accessing uh, commodities through ceiling price agreements, developing market projections, and lastly, establishing public-private partnerships. And last but not the least, I'd also like to highlight that catalytic funding is also available to help programs get started. Now, while hepatitis programs build towards the broader pool of resources. Through widening the policy scope of donors like the Global Fund, countries can now request resources to integrate hepatitis services among people living with HIV and at a risk of HIV, like people who inject drugs. Um, it's Hence, it's incredibly important to take advantage of these opportunities. We can move to the next slide. Okay, we can move to the next slide. Now, for the first time, the HCV market report includes a section on preliminary insights into harm reduction commodities that explores sort of three major commodity buckets uh, that are can be utilized in harm reduction programs, starting with opioid um, agonist maintenance therapy or OAMD commodities, overdose prevention commodities, and needles and syringes that are utilized in harm reduction programs. Now, globally, over 43% of HCV infections are actually attributed to injection drug use with regional variation. While WHO recommends providing people who inject drugs access to comprehensive services that include harm reduction, there are numerous barriers that hinder access to these services um, and hinder access to these commodities. Now, within resource-constrained and politically regulated environments, programs, affected communities, and other stakeholders often lack visibility into commodity pricing dynamics, competitive advantages, and leverage points. Furthermore, a lack of market transparency prevents public programs from making informed decisions about selecting, procuring, and introducing the relevant and correct commodities and harm reduction programs. I also do want to flag that uh, we did collect data across eight LMICs for pricing. So from now on, in case I mentioned that, you know, uh, in case I mentioned pricing across LMICs, I am specifically referring to these eight countries and not 
the whole sort of not all LMICs essentially. You can also find a section on country wise market intel snapshot, which I feel is truly a great value add of this particular section of the report, where you can find information across funding for harm reduction programs, commodity wise information, availability, status of commodities um, across the eight LMICs that I mentioned. We can move to the next slide. Now, I'll start off with the OMT commodity bucket. Now, here we have covered methadone and buprenorphine um, under this particular section. From the perspective of, a of, of the supplier landscape for these commodities, uh, for methadone and buprenorphine, they do not have a WHO PQ product in the market. However, SR approved products are available, and we have also kind of captured uh, a bunch of the products that are available um, that you can access. We've also analyzed data from INCB for manufacturing and consumption of both these commodities. And overall, we found that both manufacturing and consumption were disproportionately higher in high income countries as opposed to low income countries, which shows a very significant skew in the market. Also, across most LMICs, uh, price for methadone varied between $16 to $24 a bottle, and the cost for a 2MG tablet of buprenorphine varied between $0.06 cents to $2.5. Uh, dollars. We can move to the next slide. Now, coming to the second commodity bucket that we looked at, that is essentially overdose reversal products that uh, we, in this sort of commodity bucket, we specifically looked at naloxone, which is the primary overdose reversal product that's available. Now, access to naloxone varies incredibly widely, uh, in, and in many regions, the access is actually just restricted via prescription and in medical settings. And in certain regions, it's further restricted to specific medical settings. So for instance, you can only administer naloxone in an ambulance. You can't even get it at a hospital. So that really restricts access to this particular and rather life-saving and emergency drug. I also do want to share a note on pricing. We found that pricing of naloxone varied anywhere between, um, again, 50 cents to $9 per ampule across LMICs. And unfortunately, there is no global benchmark pricing available for this particular commodity. We can move to the next slide. Now, the last category of commodities that we analyzed were needles and syringes. Now, needles and syringe programs have proven to be incredibly effective and investment in preventing hepatitis. And WHO recommends that based on local acceptability and resource availability, these programs may also provide low death space syringes along with information about their preventative advantages over conventional syringes. At the moment, no WHO mechanism exists to get a pre-qualification for needles and syringes. And typically, national and local guidelines tend to be utilized and take sort of precedence while procuring these commodities. A key highlight from highlighting this market was that we also really tried to look at the coverage of needles and syringe programs across countries. So essentially, how many needles and syringes are distributed per person who injects drugs per year? Now, a published study on global coverage of interventions to prevent and manage drug-related harms showed that among people who inject drugs globally, on an average, only 35 needles and syringes are distributed per person who injects drugs per year. Now, using some of this coverage data, we further calculated that there is a need for over 3 billion needles and syringes that are to be distributed annually through NSP sites to achieve high coverage. Now, uh, there are defined sort of parameters for what low, uh, medium, and high coverage looks like, and high coverage is over 200 needles and syringes per person per year. It is also worth noting that market intelligence for these products uh, that are being used and procured for harm reduction remains incredibly restricted as there's a lack of insight into country level uh, needles and syringe volume data. We can move to the next slide. Now to conclude this section, I would like, kind of like to leave you with some of our reflections as we had kind of, as we went about putting together this harm reduction section. Now, um, our, our exercise, our sort of landscaping exercise over last year really exposed a lot of glaring gaps in the market for harm reduction commodities. Harm reduction strategies can contribute to the global goal of eliminating HCV as a public health threat. And it is crucial that we focus on strengthening and scaling up these services. From our perspective, there is a lot of work that needs to be done across three, the three pillars that are mentioned on the slide. We must formulate interventions on the back of greater market transparency, specifically in the context of NMICs. Investments in further country landscaping and analysis can support a better understanding of the market dynamics, identification of gaps and opportunities, and developing further strategies to drive impact. With that, I conclude the market highlights from the report. Please feel free to send in our questions if you would like to re reflect on the report further. We are also happy to kind of connect with you over email. 
and discuss any of the data that uh, is present uh, in the report. With that, I hand it uh, back to Aurea. Thanks so much, um, Robia and Navia, for talking us through um, just key highlights in the report. And I just want to say, you know, this has been covered in 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 just under thirty minutes, but we have a lot more detail in the report. So we want to encourage um, all participants to please do um, go to the report and, and and read through some of the details we weren't able to cover here. Um, just to sort of take now. Um, you know, some of the highlights um, that Robia and, and Navia covered, which sometimes can feel a little theoretical and really sort of understand how um, they get put in practice and, and sort of translate into impact. We want to now move into hearing a range of perspectives on both the importance of market intelligence um, and the impact um, that you know, market opportunities can have to catalyze programs um, uh, for patients. Um, to do this, I first want to um, welcome members from our Chai Nigeria team, Chukameka Gucha, who leads our hepatitis and COVID-19 therapeutics programs in Nigeria, and Ola Yinka Disa, who supports health system strengthening and access to share a little bit about their experience on the market shaping work in Nigeria and how they've leveraged market intelligence together with other partners uh, in country to, to um, make some gains on markets um, in, in Nigeria. So Chukumeka and Yinka, over to you. Thank you, Oriel, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to share our country perspectives. So we'll just do this very quickly in five minutes. Next slide, please. Yes, so we just highlight, um, you know, the market shipping work and also demonstrate how the, you know, market report has really helped to drive pricing deals in the country. And we'll we'll speak to the future opportunities. So I pass on to my colleague Olayinka to um, share the context around the present work we're doing in Nasarawa. Inka. Yeah, thanks, Chukwemeka. So just to run through this quickly. Um, in 2017, the Chai Hepatitis Program employed a subnational programming strategy in Nassau State, Nigeria, due to its relatively high viral hepatitis burden. Um, initial challenges encountered at the time is, um, involved the lack of political will, limited access to viral hepatitis services, and high commodity costs. And this was all compounded by the lack of donor uh, support and domestic resources. I mean, this slide we would show how innovative approaches were explored to alleviate the out-of-pocket burden through collaborating with government and stakeholders to leverage market intelligence for significant price reductions for um, hepatitis commodities. And from a baseline of over $350 for a month's dose of DAAs, um, demand generation activities initiated in a pilot facility in Nassau at the time facilitated an increase in the patient pool thus enhancing treatment uptake and laying a groundwork for program scale up. Um, this was achieved in 2018. And this, all these efforts um, facilitated pool procurement, improving access and program visibility. In the year 2020, CHI supported the National State Ministry of Health to leverage evidence generated from all these programming efforts to advocate for domestic resources from the state leadership. This led to a viral hepatitis elimination program that offered free HIV services to the HIV population, which eventually yielded partnerships that catalyzed an access pricing of $60 for three months of HCV curative treatment. In 2022, this was achieved in 2022, and this marked a substantial 94% pricing reduction from baseline. Despite the significant increase in treatment initiations impacted from all these accomplishments. Addressing the financing gap remains pivotal for optimizing access and achieving expected treatment uptake relative to the high viral hepatitis burden in Nassau State. And the program's um, continued evolution prompted the extension of this insight, this market shaping insights to TDF, for hepatitis B PMTCT, which is an emerging area in the quest for um, viral hepatitis elimination. At this point, I'll quickly hand over to Chukwemeka to um, take us through the rest of the 
presentation. Thank you, Yinka, for really uh, bringing out the work we have done in the hepatitis C space. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, while we have recorded these great strides, um, it was important to, to look at the hepatitis B space. I know Meg had mentioned this at the end of the presentation, so we we'll touch on B at this point. Next slide, please. Yes, so um, taking the learnings we have got from, you know, market shipping around B and also working with the market intel team and the report and as we mentioned earlier we called out we had secured um pricing deals with hepatitis fund at the, at the, at the at last year so we were think we just thought that how do we domesticate this price in any country um the first thing was to really add, add opportunities the burden of hepatitis in nigeria is quite huge over 60 million persons and now our pilot state also has that huge burden as well so the idea was there of course there was the opportunity for investment case uh, demand was available and and uh, working with the state ministry of health able to demonstrate full procurement mechanisms um, securing partnerships with 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 other uh, collaborative CSOs, WHA, and other components present uh, in the C space, also looking at the B as well, um, and also secondary government commitment to, you know, procurement of those commodities, and and with that, we we'll move forward to you know engage with former companies, the partners in country to say, look, this deals have been secured globally. How do we apply? How do we bring this home to Nigeria? And using that model, of course. The volume guarantees or the full procurement. Uh, there was still government commitment. There was a patient voice speaking. We were able to domesticate this price in the Nigeria. Looking at the graph, you would see a 75% reduction from $144 for per pricing per year to as low as $36 per pricing per year, averagely $3 per month. So, what this means is the, the average mother who could not afford TDF, you know, regularly initially can now go on TDF. And uh, patients who have been uh, positive can also go on TDF conveniently without having that huge burden of cost to the patient's pocket. Next slide, please. So moving forward, and just to wrap this up for we, the Nigerian team, you know, um, we've had a growing conversation around triple elimination. And uh, with this pricing, what this means is we could actually uh, move forward with this um, for patients who are not covered under a donor program, they're able to afford TDF nicely copper in, in um, complementing the bread dosage provided and also uh, gives us that room to begin to expand donor funding to procure more TDF for um, the, 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 the patients. Ultimately, the plan is to expand this pricing deal beyond Nasarawa to across the country and ensure that we begin to uh, bring down the burden of uh, hepatitis B infections by preventing transmission to the newborns. So I'll just say thank you at this point and pass it back to Oriel to continue the presentation. Thanks so much, Chikomeka um, and team, for sharing some of your experiences and other partner experiences in, in the Nasaraba context to leverage the Intel to reduce pricing. And I think, you know, I think sort of two things that I caught in, in looking um, at some of the information you shared is, you know, just pricing agreements, global access agreements in their in themselves are not necessarily sufficient to, to translate lower in country pricing, but there's actually quite a bit of work that needs to happen within country with the ministries of health and with other partners to really analyze what uh, the market looks like in that country and, and how we can leverage these global access pricing. And great to hear how partnerships also contributed to, to bring that to fruition in Nasarawa State and, and hoping that we can continue to see this scaled uh, across the country soon. So next, um, uh, we'll hear a community perspective uh, from Dr. Annie Madden, who is the project lead for the Cuts Hep C project with International Network of People Who Use Drugs, also known as Input. Uh, Input is a global community-led network for people who use drugs, and Annie's based in Melbourne, Australia, and has been part of the global movement uh, of people who use drugs for almost three decades. So really looking forward to hearing your perspectives, Annie, and I hope you're able to come off mute now. I hope so too. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Great. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll get straight into a very quick presentation um, today. Um, as it says there, I've been asked to sort of speak on the importance of market intel on harm reduction commodities broadly, but I'm actually going to, because I was aware of other presentations and of course market intel, as we've already heard just now, takes in a whole range of issues around market dynamics and quality data and transparency and pricing issues. So there's lots that we can talk about, but I'm gonna bring a particular perspective here where I want to look at the role of the community actually in market intel on harm reduction commodities, which I think is a really important thing to talk about and is really relevant to the work we're doing on the Cuts Hep C project. So next slide, please. So as was said, I'm a project lead for the Cuts Hep C project, which is all about uh, simplifying hepatitis C pathways in low and middle income countries. Um, this is actually a new multi-consortium, multi-year, multi-country project. It's a large project funded by UnitAid. It's actually the first time that UnitAid has significantly become involved in hepatitis C and harm reduction. Uh, it's a large program of research and implementation over several years. There are three consortiums and 10 uh, low and middle income countries involved in the uh, project uh, broadly, but the Cuts Hep C project project is part of one consortium that Import is involved in, which is the MDM consortium, consortium or which is led by Medicines du Monde and also involves the Burnett Institute and University of Bristol. Now, I raised the UnitAid project and the Cuts Hep C project in particular because a part of that project, and next slide please, uh, a key part of it is focusing on uh, researching the effectiveness and acceptability of low dead space needles and syringes among people who inject drugs in the focal countries that we're working in, which are Georgia, Armenia, and Tanzania, the three countries that we will focus on out of the 10 countries involved. So, um, and there are further market shaping and advocacy aspects to that. Now, uh, just very quickly, because I'm not sure if everyone's, you know, really across sort of low dead space needles and syringes, but very quickly, you know, what are, what are low dead space needles and syringes? It's really about, as you can see with the graphic there from the high dead space syringes closest to the text through to low dead, true low dead space options. Um, it's about reducing what's called the dead space between the end of the plunger and in and around the needle hub when a syringe is depressed after it's been used and the blood that can be trapped in what is referred to as the dead space. Now, we're interested in this because there's been research in high income countries that have identified the potential for low dead space needles and syringes to reduce hep C trans transmissions if needles and syringes are, are reused. And there's, as has been said previously, a WHO recommendation on low dead space syringes that has been in place for some time, but they still are not used um, very much at all in low income countries or made available. And so this piece of work is really looking at uh, pursuing those issues and looking at investigating them further. Um, of course, you know, we've seen greatly an increase in funding for harm reduction and improvements in access over the past few years in terms of low and middle income countries. But there is still a long way to go, uh, both in terms of what countries are procuring through bids and also at the level of donor procurement practices, which others have also touched on. Next slide, please. So, you know, this, I guess, highlights why good market intel on harm reduction commodities is so important. And what I want to talk about is, you know, the fact that we know that harm reduction works and that it saves lives. But this is only the case if access and availability and coverage are to the levels they need to be. But also, it only works if we get the right harm reduction commodities to the people who need them. So it's not just about coverage and availability, it's about the right harm reduction commodities. And as I've said, currently harm reduction commodities in low and middle income countries are constrained largely by global procurement processes. Uh, people in low middle income countries who inject drugs often have access to only one option or limited options for needles and syringes, and there's insufficient access and coverage. So 
Um, I want to just quickly give a couple of examples of what we're seeing in the work we're doing in the countries we're working in that really highlight why this is so important. So, you know, we look at um, not only people only having one option, but that option might be, for example, an auto-destruct syringe that's designed technically only to be used once. The fact is, however, is that people who use drugs, as we've heard just now, they, they do not have access to anywhere near enough needles and syringes to be able to not reuse equipment. So what ends up happening is people who inject drugs are re-engineering these auto-destruct syringes. They then lead to um, you know, poor harm reduction practice where there's more vein damage, more scarring, and therefore more blood in the injecting process, and therefore more risk of hepatitis C transmission. We're also seeing in many countries, or lower middle income countries, where people who inject drugs are using oversized equipment, large barrels, large needles, thick needles, because that's all they can have access to. Um, it's not fit for purpose. And again, it increases, as you can imagine, a thick needle is obviously going to make a larger hole when it's removed than a thinner, finer needle will. And again, so we see significantly more blood in the injecting process on sites, on hands, on surfaces. And again, these are the drivers of hepatitis C transmission among people who inject drugs. And finally, the legal environment is also part of this as well. So we're seeing uh, practices where people who use drugs, uh, inject drugs are uh, trying to sort of use the harm reduction commodities that are being made available to them. But this ends up sort of undermining their harm reduction practice because of the legal environment where they're trying to uh, use drugs really quickly, rapidly to avoid police. So they're doing what's called a cold shake method and they're sort of using oversized equipment, removing the plunger, putting the, the powder into the, to the syringe, mixing water in, shaking it and going. This is also uh, increasing risk for all sorts of harm in the injecting process, including vein damage and scarring, and again, increasing the risk of hepatitis C transmission. Next slide, please, and my final slide. So I use those examples because I think it's really, it really highlights how important it is for hepatite, reducing hepatitis C transmissions to get harm reduction commodities right. And we believe the best way to do that is through community engagement and consultation with people who inject drugs themselves. Drugs and drug using practices differ from place to place. You know, one size fits all, as has been said previously, does not work. Different drugs are used, different injecting practices are used, different preparation practices are used. Um, and so uh, we need to have a really flexible and nuanced approach and we need to talk to people who inject drugs in country about what it is they need and why they need it. But unfortunately, this isn't happening sufficiently currently with procurement practices. Um, we have heard stories in the work we're doing about communities being consulted and engaged, but then nothing changing in terms of what is actually procured. So if we're going to be consulting with people and saying we're taking person-centered approaches, we need to listen to that advice and act on it. People who use, use drugs know what they need and why in their daily lives. You know, having said that, it's also the case in this space that sometimes people don't know what they don't know, and that is because people may only, as I say, have access to very limited harm reduction commodities and needles, types of needles and syringes. They may not even be aware that there are better quality equipment and quality pr um, products that they can be using to reduce their risk of hepatitis C that, that are available to them, possibly available to them. Some of the ways we think you can address that is by working with organizations like Input and the regional people who use drugs networks um, across the world. Uh, they also are part of local communities and work with local communities to be able to uh, show people who use inject drugs on the, in uh, local communities what's possible and uh, work with people to identify local needs and tailor solutions. So bottom line, um, you know, achieving hepatitis C elimination goals equals working with people who inject drugs to really understand their needs and their practices in detail and then responding to and meeting those specific harm reduction needs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Annie, for really amplifying the role of the community in this market shaping work and you know, reminding us that it's, it's not just about lowering price for commodities, but ensuring that this work is tied to 
the right and diverse range of commodities that enable that flexibility and nuance that you talk to for different contexts and ensuring that we're engaging uh, the community in this process. Um, I think your reflections actually now nicely tie uh, to, to our next speaker. Um, uh, you know, the, the Global Fund is one of the largest procurement agents for, for harm reduction. So, you know, uh, really keen to hear some of Sean McGovern's thoughts on uh, what you just shared. Sean McGovern is an advisor for um, the HIV product introduction at the Global Fund. In his role, Sean focuses on strengthening the capacity of the Global Fund to finance and support countries to introduce new products and include priority HCV and harm reduction commodities in their procurement as well. Sean, really keen to hear your perspectives on how opportunities um, in the HCV and harm reduction market uh, are informing Global Fund's investments and priorities and, and, and how um, you're taking into account some of the community perspectives that he just talked through. Over to you, Sean. Thanks so much, Oriel. Um, and I say this recognizing how rare it is for the Global Fund to not have slides, but I do not have slides today and we'll just be sharing two key updates that I think are very relevant to all of you based on these discussions and updates that will then of course cascade into future um, conversations. I just wanted to first start by thanking um, the whole CHI team for the development and publication of this report as well as dissemination efforts such as this. Um, we at the Global Fund greatly value uh, market reports such as these that help us to better understand the complex environments, landscapes, markets that we're supporting routine procurement um, and implementation of. Um, it helps with our direct sourcing um, with our suppliers. It helps uh, with sharing the lessons learned that you've gathered from countries with our country team so it can better inform implementation. And very selfishly, it helps me and some of those in um, technical teams who are trying to look at how we um, in the Global Fund can better support um, our PRs and communities uh, with providing access to the commodities that uh, they need. Um, so the two updates that I wanted to share is one where we are as the Global Fund because we're in a state of change, as many of you know, and then two, um, some important work that we're just starting as it relates to harm reduction and optimizing the what we do in recognition of what's been shared today. Um, by Chai, by Annie, by others, um, where we, the Global Fund, in some cases are serving as a bottleneck to clear market intelligence, transparency and procurement. So first, where we are, uh, many of you know, is that we are transitioning from our previous three year cycle, grant cycle six, over to our current grant cycle, GC7. Um, GC7 just kicked off and you might have seen news recently if you're tracking um, Global Fund updates that we have approved $9.2 billion in new grants to fight AIDS, TB, malaria in more than 70 countries, um, which is obviously very exciting. Of course, what this means is given they were just approved, we do not have any insights into what we are planning today, such as in HCV um, investments, as well as harm reduction. I recognize these insights are very um, valued and valuable to the shared efforts that we're all working on. Um, and we're hoping in the coming months to be able to um, uh, to be able to share any insights from those analyses once we get to analyzing the approved budgets. Um, so stay tuned there. As mentioned, what went into those budgets was clarified policy in terms of what we are able to fund across hepatitis and harm reduction through our various policy and information notes, which are available online, and I'm happy to share in the chat here. Um, so key takeaway is stay tuned. We will, we are committed. Susie, as many of you know from the HIV team and I, um, we'll be happy to share any uh, lessons learned from our investments as soon as we're able to analyze them. The second point I just wanted to share an update on is um, an exciting initiative that we're kicking off as it relates to harm reduction and optimizing our procurement. Um, as many folks on this call know, um, we are the largest funder um, and financier of uh, harm reduction products and services. Um, and we play a pretty significant role um, in the market here. Um, we also acknowledge that there are things we do that make it difficult to support routine harm reduction, market shaping and um, procurement um, and service delivery, um, such as the lack of reference prices, um, the lack of published data on uh, past harm reduction procurement um, and many other areas. So we are 
sort of leaning into what is captured in our strategy by having an intensified focus on prevention, by thinking through ways to optimize and accelerate new product introduction, and to think through our market shaping efforts to kick off a collaboration with Chai um, that just started to address four main areas of work. Um, one of which includes optimizing our Wombo catalog, um, Wombo being the procurement platform for the Global Fund, um, to reflect, um, as Annie just captured really well, and as Chai captures in the presentation as well, um, products that actually meet the needs of people as well as programs. Um, we have heard anecdotally of um, issues where the wrong needles and syringes might have been procured or only one needle and syringe is procured and implemented, and that's not meeting uh, the needs of um, people who use drugs as well as our program. So one initiative that we'll do is have a first refresh of our um, Wombo catalog, as well as support continued updates as the very useful uh, work that many are doing on this call, including what Annie mentioned on understanding uh, preferences uh, so that our, our catalog reflects uh, those needs. One other thing we're going to work on through this initiative is think through how we can better share um, and leverage our intelligence on pricing. Um, currently, we do not have a public reference price list for harm reduction commodities. Um, we also don't include products in our public uh, uh, reference price um, dashboard. And we recognize that leads to challenges. And we, in essence, are creating a black box in the space um, in terms of market intelligence. And we also saw this through GC7 planning, where we saw great variations across what countries were budgeting for harm reduction commodities um, uh, in this space. Um, and that leads to many of the issues that I think Navia captured well and Chai did as well in terms of missing opportunities for efficiencies, driving down costs that then can be reprioritized in other areas, as well as just as a market creating a sustainable and healthy market in the space. So we're going to give some thought into how we can leverage our insights into prices and reference pricing to strengthen our work and the work of PRs to inform better budgets, procurements, implementation, as well as think through how we can share that externally with all of you. The third component of this initiative is going to be analyzing existing budgets um, that were just approved and that we're excited to dig into um, for harm reduction um, so that we can do a few things. One, feed into our procurement service agents so they can better anticipate and prepare uh, the products that might be ordered to minimize lead times and support that procurement with more efficiency. To also work with the many partners in the space on market shaping initiatives, um, such as through Unitaid Investments, um, to support market shaping, um, where we might not be directly responsible for, but we recognize that we benefit significantly. And by we, I mean our programs and people. Um, so analyzing those to understand what we might be buying over the next three years to identify what those market solutions might be with all of you. The last point, and I think there was actually a question on this, um, is looking into any lessons learned from the supply chains of harm reduction commodities and documenting those in a nice just two to three page case study that can be shared widely, not only internally within the Global Fund, um, but also externally with all of you. Um, so we can think and sort of assess how we can improve supply chains for these essential commodities from the point of delivery in country all the way down to uh, commodity delivery and access to the people um, who are using uh, whatever commodities they might want and prefer. Um, so that will be the fourth output. Um, importantly, while we're kicking off this work um, in direct collaboration with Chai, it will be done in consultation with many of the partners on this call. Um, and we're just getting sort of the gears going, but we're looking forward to collaborating with many um, here, such as the WHO and Input and MDM, Harm Reduction International, um, Chai, um, I know who'll be leading it, Unitaid, PATH, and so many others, um, just to make sure that we are optimizing what we do as a partnership and so that we can better meet the needs um, of the programs and people um, of which these um, products are really essential to. So those are just my immediate reflections. Really looking forward to an exciting year, and I recognize I'm the last one, so I'll hand it over to Oriel to jump into Q&A. Thanks so much, Sean. Just really great to hear some initial updates on uh, the GC7 round and looking forward to hearing some more details on what the investments for hepatitis and harm reduction um, 
um, will be uh, over the next three years uh, once you're able to analyze that data and really appreciate that the Global Fund is leaning into strengthening procurement and optimization of its investments um, in harm reduction and hepatitis. Uh, and we're really just looking forward to working together with you and other partners on, on, on this initiative. So, um, you know, we're, we're getting close to the end of the webinar, but we have a number of questions and I want to make sure that we have some time to answer some of these questions live and have a discussion. So let me just pass it over now to, to Rithaban Gautam and Umesh Chawla from our global markets and hepatitis teams to, to facilitate some of this discussion and raise some of these questions. Thanks, Oriel. Uh, I think before we get into a specific question, one thing that I would like to highlight is that if we are unable to take a specific question right now due to time limit, we will reach out individually and make sure that we answer those. Uh, but to begin with, there are some interesting questions that have come up, come with, uh, come up, and uh, it will be good to get some panelists' insights on that. The first one is: What is the learning from Egypt that high burden countries can emulate? Some countries, despite voluntary license, are unable to eliminate hepatitis C. I think with respect to voluntary license, as we all know, that has been one move which has allowed generic access, generic DA access across most of the low middle income countries. Having said that, we are cognizant that there are countries, specifically in Latin America, which still do not have access to generic DAs and keep on incurring high prices for DAs. But even within the countries which can access generic DAs, I think some of the challenges was talked about in the presentations, including high in-country markups and also low programmatic testing and treatment of people despite the cost being low. But let me actually request Meg Dorothy from WHO to give her insights on what is the learning from Egypt that high burden countries can emulate and why some countries are unable to eliminate hepatitis C virus despite voluntary licensing. Meg, can I pass it over to you? Oh, thank you. I hope I'm able to uh, answer that. I, I, I think it's about um, where things really worked well, for example, in some of the countries like um, Egypt and others. It's because there was a commitment from a national commitment, a political commitment, and um, I, I would, would say that if there are countries who are trying to do this without that political or national commitment, they may, they face a, a harder uphill road to convince that there needs to be that added investment. And then in terms of um, ensuring that uh, uh, countries are getting the best prices, uh, I think what we see in some of the middle income countries or the high middle income countries, they may not be actually working together or leveraging their ability across different countries to, to get the best pricing. So they're negotiating on their own or they may not have that um, negotiating power with, the, with either the generics or the originators. So by, my, my sense here is that we need to do a bit more, either working through Wambo or through other crossed um, approaches for getting the best pricing and trying to advise countries that have already been paying too much of how they might be able to renegotiate the prices that they do have. And then lastly, ensuring that there is budget and commitment from their national health authorities to be able to invest because it is about an investment case. Money in now will lead to outcomes later and making that very clear will help them, I guess, put that higher investment in forward. Um, but uh, let's see what we can do about cross-country negotiations and, and purchasing power as we move forward collectively. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Moving on, I think on the harm reduction space, we have a couple of questions and I'll pass it over to Mace. The question is, what are some of the major barriers in terms of access to harm reduction commodities in low middle income countries? And how can stakeholders in country come together to better understand their harm reduction market? Um, Omis, over to you. Ritavan. Thanks, Ritavan. Uh, uh, I, I'll take the liberty of adding on to what Meg said, and, and it's uh, uh, really heartening to know that Egypt is also planning to scale up its harm reduction program, which was not at, at uh, 
at the level uh, with regards to um, elimination agenda of Egypt. So that's really great uh, because it starts looking at the sub segments of population that are affected uh, and unfortunately marginalized. So that's um, that's something that uh, perhaps many countries can take as an example in addition to what uh, Meg mentioned about Egypt. Uh, I think uh, with regards to uh, the key barriers for um, uh, for harm reduction products uh, across LMICs and LDCs uh, continues to remain that uh, drug consumption or drug use is always in conflict with the law of the local land, and some in some places it's much more stringent uh, than the others, and uh, there is always this tension between the programmatic and the community need and what the policy of the country or the regulations or the law of the countries allow them to do. And uh, in, in, in terms of, and I would really love to also uh, uh, look towards Annie to, to add on a little bit more uh, as, as she represents uh, input. Uh, with the uh, second question with regards to how markets are shaped because of harm reduction products, it's, it's basically the, the whole triangulation of the policy framework that I just mentioned. I mean, does the country allow harm reduction or not? And even if it does, to what extent? Uh, what would be the program need in the sense what would the country or the program uh, would require to do a good job? And the third data point being the community itself. What does the community want? So these three things which are equally important need to work in tandem to, to come to a point where the the needs are uh, are identified the quantities are identified which actually influences the market itself so if there is a demand there is production if there is production there is competition uh, if there is competition there is uh, a negotiated price and and in the situation of harm reduction all this will require to be assisted it's not going to happen um, organically as as it may have happened to by many other uh, products and and those of us who've been around uh, we also know that the hiv uh, drugs as well as hepatitis drugs the prices did not come down organically despite the availability of generic uh, 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 products uh, across and india being being one of the major uh, uh, manufacturers uh, it still required a consistent amount of advocacy and 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 effort from the communities as well as multiple stakeholders to ensure that the prices were good enough for for countries to adopt and good enough for programs to roll out. And I'll hand it over to Annie if she has any reflections on any of these questions. Over to you, Annie. Not sure if I see Annie is still there. Annie, if you're there, please come off mute. Um, okay, maybe uh, uh, I'll pass it to you for closing. Because we are right in the back and we only have two minutes left for this webinar. So maybe, and we'll answer the remaining questions in chat. Okay, thanks so much, um, uh, Rituban. I, you know, I did take a look at the questions that came in in the Q and A, and there've been a range of questions, specifically about uh, product availability on the diagnostic side, and 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 sort of programmatic implementation um, um, perspectives on supply chain and procurement. So I think it is quite important that we compile those questions and 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 make sure that we we respond to them. Um, just to say overall, I think it's 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 really hard to find the right words to wrap up a webinar that has covered such a breadth of information and, and critical perspectives. And I'll just start by first thanking all of our speakers, specifically our external speakers, Meg, Annie, and Sean, for taking time out of your really busy schedules to, to come and share perspectives and really add some color to, to the market shaping work that we're we're talking about. You know. As I said, um, you know, earlier on, right at the start, it's clear that hepatitis C commodities are becoming more affordable and more cost effective. Um, and 
I think this really does give governments and donors an opportunity to maximize investments and put more patients on treatment. Um, and we've seen this done before, as Meg talked about, you know, with Egypt and, and other countries like Rwanda, with political will and modest financing programs can really ensure that these commodities reach patients in need um, so that we can make progress towards those ambitious viral hepatitis elimination goals. Um, Meg highlighted earlier on and, you know, I think uh, there is some concern now that if, if we don't start to make this progress that our market gains over the last few years might slip away. So there's quite a bit of work for us to do together as a community um, to make sure that we can start to accelerate progress again here. You know, on, on the harm reduction side, um, you know, this report really step, uh, you know, serves as just a very initial step towards achieving market transparency. But I, I think we, 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 we know and recognize that we're just really scratching the surface here and a lot more research analysis and work, specifically work together with the communities is going to be required um, for us to gain uh, a better comprehensive understanding of the market trends and really transform them into um, improving and making gains in this area as well. Um, so lots more for us to do and just really excited to continue to work together with all of you um, uh, to push forward um, in, in this process. Uh, finally, once again, just want to thank uh, our CHAI team for, for leading this process and putting together this webinar. And specifically, again, Rithavan, um, Navia, and, and Rovia for really guiding CHAI's process on this from, from end to end. Thanks so much, everybody, for, for joining our webinar and looking forward to keeping this conversation going through other platforms as well.